I'm going to ask you one question. How many of you really believe that uh, Alberta is in a fiscal downturn? Unanimous decision. Isn't that amazing? In the midst of a serious economic downturn in Alberta, we have many obstacles to overcome. The loss of revenue from low prices in the oil industry is seen as another catastrophe. But I put forward that it is in fact a marvelous opportunity to make changes in Alberta that will produce long-lasting economic and social results. One of the tenets of conservatism is economic freedom. And if we let things go the way it is, we are about to lose it in Alberta. The so-called Alberta advantage is being eroded by every single government in the past 20 years. What I propose to you today is to put in perspective why we are in such a quandary. Alberta does not have a revenue problem. We have a serious spending problem, which is now acerbated by a slowdown in the revenues caused by lower oil prices. In my view, the average oil price in the next couple of years is going to be fluctuating between 40 and $70 a barrel. This is a far, far days of the $100 a barrel. This will come back, but not within two or three years, maybe, maybe. So in effect, the government of Alberta has got to take a new direction in managing the financial affairs of this province. And I will put to you three areas that needs to be looked at immediately. They are healthcare, education, and one that most people just discard, but it is extremely important, is the funding of local authorities. The latter are institutions who constantly demand more money from the provincial government or wants more powers to tax citizens on a regular basis. Let's start with health care. We constantly hear reports of lack of service, shortages of beds, and long waiting times for surgery. Did you know that Alberta spends one of the highest per capita on health care than any other province in this country? Yet, we still clamor for better services. Attempts at restructuring have done nothing to improve the system. In fact, the more they restructure, the more scandals happen in Alberta. We hear nowadays of high cost of roaming charges on cell phones for professionals from healthcare. We hear about the demands for reimbursement of executive expenses. These are not the issues we should be talking about. We should be talking about the services that are supposed to be delivered by health care. Surgeries cannot be performed because there is a shortage of staff. We have union agreements that prevent nurses to work more hours in the operating rooms. Foreign nurses and doctors are not being recertified at a faster rate. Professional protectionism is rife in this province and the rest of the country. It is not that we don't have doctors or nurses. We have them lining up to come to Canada because Canada is a great country. The problem is 
protectionism of professionals being recertified in Canada is eating a roadblock every single day. But ultimately, nothing short of an acceptance and implementation of some form of private health care will improve the system in Alberta and in Canada. We Canadians are averse to talk about privatization of health care. However, Ralph Klein played chicken with health care in Alberta, and he lost. And who's the losing party? It's all of us Albertans. We lost. And we have to reverse the course to ensure that healthcare is improved in this province. Second, let me talk about education. I spent the last 10 years as an educator at uh, both Mount Royal University and SAIT. I taught economics and I taught public sector finance. We have an education system today which does not respect good teachers, but one that favors union agreements that reduces the number of class hours and supports the firing of teachers who do their job properly while protecting underperforming teachers. The Alberta Union of Teachers did not support Lyndon Dorval when he chose to use a zero policy for non-performing students. Recently we hear that a teacher in Red Deer is choosing not to mark his math students at all because that will allow more students to attend his classes. The Alberta Teachers Union is constantly supporting changes that is moving education away from the three R's. I can assure you from experience that some of my students coming into my class at a bachelor's degree have some real difficulty in basic math. And for high school to continue to promote different methods of teaching is going to produce a new era and a new batch of uninformed and people who are not going to be able to do simple math. And it's going to affect their lives, not only the lives of everybody, but their own lives. Let's put it this way. No wonder that according to the 2013 OECD report on education, Canada is ranked 13th in math, 13th. We are falling behind Scandinavian countries and most importantly, or unfortunately, behind Asian countries. The United States are not, not doing any better. They are ranked 26th. The problem that we have is, at the university level, we are too focused on marketing rather than educating. We are now producing courses that students want as opposed to educate them in the fundamental education that is required to enter life as a professional or as an educated person. When there are cuts, the administration chooses to immediately increase their fees rather than make cuts and adjustments in the administrative cost. Unions and collective agreements are killing our education system. Now, the third part that I want to talk about is local authorities. Many people think that because local authorities is the first line that people use to get services, that we should just grant them more powers of taxation. 
In Canada, local authorities are a creation of provincial governments. And as such, these entities are uh, relied on property taxes and handouts from provincial governments to provide services. For instance, Alberta has two large cities, Calgary and Edmonton. Did you know that they are administered very differently? Let me put to you, for instance, the administration of utilities. In Edmonton, most of the uh, utilities are managed under EPCO, which is a totally separate entity from council. Although we have NMAX in Calgary, the electricity is under NMAX. However, most people don't know this. NMAX is still tied to council who are the shareholders of NMAX. It's not you and me, it's council who are the shareholders of NMAX. Utilities, water and sewer are still under the jurisdiction of council. Years ago when I wrote Take Back City Hall, I coined the, the, the word vicarious taxation for Calgary. What that means is Calgary has been using utility rates as a means to raise more money for the general fund without having to report it as a tax, but instead as a rate. Until some years ago, $50 million were taken out of water, $50 million out of the wastewater utility to go into the general fund. And most people didn't know that it came from your rates. The problem with these kind of things is that when you use the rates, as a means to do raise taxes, it affects a lot of people because utilities are, from an economic point of view, a necessity, and you have to pay for it. And a lot of people on fixed income are paying high rates for their water and sewer and electricity without any accountability from the city. Calgary, for instance, demands from the province a number of times, uh, under different mayors, for more money. I do not believe that this is the way that we should be believe, you know, dealing with local authorities. What we need is a complete reform of funding for local authorities. When the new premier of Alberta says that Albertans should look in the mirror, let me say that, Mr. Premier, you and your government should look in the mirror, and not us, Albertans, that should be looking in the mirror. The situation that we have today in Alberta has been on going on for decades. And the Stelmac and the Redford governments, they have governed as progressives, not as conservatives. What we must remind governments is that there is only one taxpayer. When we have surpluses, we spend without priorities and use the funding for political purposes. We must ensure that the Heritage Fund is well funded and that it is not used as a piggy bank for bad fiscal management. In fact, today, there is a very good article by Mark Milkey about the Heritage Fund and how we have squandered the opportunity to make the Heritage Fund a true fiscal management tool for, for Alberta. I came to Canada in 1978. I left 
England as an economic refugee. People would say, what? An economic refugee? Let me repeat, I came here in 1978. Let me tell you why. I was working as a consultant in England, very well paid. I was very happy, so happy and doing so well that my employer gave me a promotion. With a promotion, I got a car. And do you know what happened to me? The first month of my new job, my paycheck was smaller than in my previous job because I had moved into a different tax bracket. Do you know what it was at the time? Not for me, but a combined earned and earned earned income in England at that time was, wait for it, 98%. These were the times when people like Tom Jones, Engelbert and Padink were just leaving England. Those were the times when England was known as the sick man of Europe. And I came to Canada. I believe that he who pays the piper should call the tune. I know that many of you will oppose some of the power of higher levels of government to impose certain rules on lower levels of government. But the past has shown us that too often members of the mush sector, which is municipalities, universities, and so on, claim poverty. And you never get any change in their service delivery. And we continue to see increase in taxes if funding is really needed by these institutions, we should ask them to implement user fees as opposed to use property taxes. Let me propose some solutions to you. You may agree, you may not disagree. First and foremost, the government of Alberta should use proper accounting standards to report its financial results. Alberta does not report surplus from operating activities, unlike most private institutions or organizations. In fact, they use charge change in all assets, including non-income producing capital to calculate surplus. No wonder, a couple of months ago, we had a deficit. Then last week, we come back, we have a surplus. The problem is, as an accountant, and even the Auditor General hasn't got a clue what's going on. There is no transparency under the current standards used by the Alberta government, and therefore there is no accountability under the reporting system that exists in Alberta. So. What we should be doing is look at some reform in taxation. As I said, some of you may disagree with me. I am a believer in a sales tax. And I will explain to you why a sales tax is better in a minute. But I have a caveat. A sales tax of up to 5% in Alberta should be coupled with an increase of the minimum taxable income from 17787 to 18000 So the very bottom will have a higher income tax minimum. I would be against the removal of the flat tax. Because if you look at experiences in the United States, most places where they don't have income tax, for instance, or they have a flat tax, these states have a lower unemployment rate than other 
states in the, in the country. We need to have a change in property tax laws. There is absolutely no correlation between the value of a property and the education cost. The cost of education should be transferred to the income tax. Remove the market value assessment system for property taxes calculations. It's a joke because market value assessment is not a realized value. It is a paper value upon which the government taxes you. It's a joke. We talk about economic freedom as a tenet of conservatism. Conservatives should rise up against that kind of, of taxation. Instead, in my view, the value of the purchase price should be the base for computing your property taxes. And in future years, the value should be increased by the consumer price index. And let me make it quite clear, not the municipal price index as used by the city of Calgary, for example, because that's a misnomer and it is not a recognized measurement of price index. We should restructure the government. We should increase the use of P3s and private public partnerships at all levels of government in this province. We should demand that when money is granted to lower levels of government, that they use P3s to provide the service. Fund municipalities from a percentage of yearly surpluses. However, in the year we have a deficit, they shouldn't get any money at all. Because you and I, as private citizens, know that when there is an economic downturn, what do we do when we don't have any money? We cut back. Only governments use a different perspective because they can. When they don't have any money, they raise your taxes. And we should change this. The funding of local authorities must change to force them to live within their means at every step of an economic situation. I have talked about the influence of unions in healthcare and education. In Canada, it may be utopian to consider a right to work legislation as a freedom. While I would advocate changes to the laws and removal of the RAND formula in the short term, I believe that it is going to be time for government of Alberta to start looking at the size of the labor force and the cost of unionized workers' benefits in this province. It may be a tough sell. However, it is badly needed. One of the problems with the current government of Alberta lies in its name. Let me ask you a question. Who is the worst enemy of con conservatism? No, another conservative. Yes, yeah. That's where the problem is. Progressive conservative is an oxymoron. You cannot be a progressive and be a conservative at the same time because we have missed out and misused the word progressive. In its real definition, progressive means moving forward. In political terms, progressive nowadays means tax and spend. So therefore, Mr. Premier, you want to make changes? Look in the mirror and change the name of your party to the Alberta Conservative, not the progressives, and get those progressives out of your party because they are 
spoiling our future. Conservative values are about freedoms. The freedom to choose, the freedom of speech, the freedom of association, and most of all, economic freedom. True social values are about education, health care, and respect for the rule of law. Before I conclude, I would like to leave you with this thought. Conservatives should leave their egos at the door and avoid being trapped by social wedge issues set up by political correct liberal zealots. I am optimistic about the future of conservatism, but cautious about candidates who will compromise conservative principles to gain and stay in power. Therefore, my advice to conservatives is compromise on process and procedures, never compromise on principles. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. I'd be surprised if we get the discussion done before lunch, and I'd be happy if we didn't. Uh, 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 Paul, go ahead. Paul. Uh, first question on foreign doctors and nurses. Do you feel that uh, they should be allowed to come in and just set up uh, a private clinic business and to function under that entity because they're not being or how, no. how do you see them just moving in and being accredited no. What do you see? No, not at all. I want good doctors to look after us. We need a proper accreditation system. The problem we have today is all to do with the medical profession who wants to restrict the number of doctors. So they make the qualification of doctors and the recertification a very lengthy process, especially on where they can get internship and where they can start practicing to get the so-called Canadian experience. No, I don't want to open the doors. I want to open the doors to good doctors, but I want to force the profession to have a proper, accountable, transparent system to accredit and make those people qualify. It, it goes on for any profession, accountants or anybody. We talk about a shortage of labor force in this country. But if we continue to invite people to come to this country and not allow them to practice under their accreditation and proper recertification, we Canadians are going to lose because we are not making use of the proper skills that these people can add to us.